Welcome back to the latest emergency edition of Until Saturday. I'm Ari Wasserman, joined by my esteemed colleague, David Ubbin, who's in Not Athens, Colorado. Georgia right now, but might need to revert his airplane and timeshare that he's gotten from all the miles that he's flown to Colorado to discuss Deion Sanders' latest decision. And uh, for the most part, all the moves that he has made during his short time at Colorado have seemed to be savvy, um, very good. I think the team has played better than people thought they would. But on Friday, news broke that Deion Sanders has made some changes to his offensive coordinating duties. Uh, Pat Shermer is now involved uh, instead of Sean Lewis, who I thought was the best offseason hire that he had. Uh, it just seems like a bizarre time to make such a switch. It seems a bizarre time to fiddle with who I think most people thought was their best assistant. And uh, I have you here, Dave, to help me break that down. So what's your what's your initial thought of this, and uh, what do you think? Uh, Deion Sanders is not a patient man. And for me, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that this is not a short-sighted move. Um, ultimately, I, Deion wants to run the ball more. He just does. Uh, he's been complaining about this for a while, um, but they don't have the offensive line to really do that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some decent backs, but they don't really have a back that you can just turn and hand it to. Uh, Alton McCaskill was their highest profile uh, transfer uh, post spring, I guess the AAC freshman of the year, but he still come back from a knee injury and he has been kind of very slow to, to catch on and, uh, and he's red shirting, but ultimately uh, the offensive line is the issue here. And I think Dion wants to do something, but I think it's a, it's a short sighted move because you're looking to, Hey, we want to maybe slow down the tempo a little bit. We want to run the ball, but your result is two things to me. One, you're asking Pat Shermer, who has not coached college football since 1998 to run a very college offense, which is what Sean Lewis runs. Um, it's a cousin of the Baylor offense. Um, they're not going to obviously switch, switch schemes in the middle of this. So you're asking him to do that, which he, he doesn't really have a lot of experience doing. He's only been uh, on this staff uh, since camp. And I think he came in the middle of camp. Uh, and usually when you have a lot of guys who don't have college experience that come in from the pros, it doesn't go well. And two, Sean Lewis left a head coaching job to take this job. Um, I think he felt like, you know, he wasn't getting the opportunities he would have liked to have gotten um, at Kent State. Felt like, hey, this is a coordinator job that might be a, a quicker road. Um, the, the MAC, once the cradle of coaches, has, has kind of surrendered that label in a lot of ways. So you do that and you make a change eight games in to a guy that a lot of people in college sports respect and really feel like is a, a great offensive mind. I have a hard time believing that that this doesn't signal that it's going to be tougher to get, to get uh, really good assistant coaches in the future. And a lot of coaches, when they take jobs, when they hire assistants, there's a lot of trust involved. Dion didn't know Sean Lewis. Sean Lewis didn't know Dion. This was kind of a random hire. It was, Hey, we want to run Alabama's defense. That's why they hired Charles Kelly. And Hey, we want to run the Baylor offense. That's why they hired Sean Lewis. And so there's not a lot of personal uh, attachment here where Dion does have guys on his staff, um, you know, uh, Flea Harrell's one of those guys. Um, you know, they, there's, a, there's a couple other coaches he's been with, you know, literally dating back to his days coaching Pee Wee football. These guys are not that. You've got two guys that are running two of the most in vogue systems in college. And I, I just, I get that you want to run the ball more. And maybe there's a conflict of, uh, uh, of viewpoints and, and how you want to do that. But making this change and essentially demoting and essentially, I mean, if Sean Lewis is still on this staff in 2024, I'll be shocked. It's just strikes. Well, me that's the thing. I don't want to interrupt you. Time. Yeah. But like you are making a decision that basically seems to me all but guarantees that your offensive coordinator is going to leave. Yes. I'll be like shocked that, if that's not the case. Like that, like that to me is the, the tough. Like, first of all, you know, Colorado's in a position right now where their season isn't terrible, isn't going terribly. They're four and four. I thought they were competitive with a very good. Uh, UCLA team a week ago. Um, I know I'm looking at the rushing numbers right now, and you have 24 carries for 25 yards. That's yeah. not where you want to be. I think part of that's uh, I, I will say, though, 
I will say, I think Sean Lewis, some of the creativity we saw earlier in the season, making up for some of the offensive line issues. Right, right. I haven't that's... seen as much of that. And so I get the frustration. Well, I mean, that's really difficult, too, you know, to, to be like cutting edge every single week. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, too, is it doesn't really help when your most dynamic ball carrier is 5'9". Like, that's also that's part of it. That's probably generous also. Till yeah. Edwards may not be 5'9". I mean, five he's nine. not – He's not very big, and you know yeah. you need somebody with some sort of size if you're going to try to overcome your offensive line issues. So, yeah, you know this to me is is two pronged. One, I I don't really know if we're at the point where people care about what this means for Colorado's wins and losses as it pertains to the rest of the year. I know that we're fighting uh, to see about bowl eligibility, but like, what does this mean for Sean Lewis? What does this mean for Deion Sanders' reputation as a coach? And what does this mean about acquiring forward-thinking coordinators to come work for you if, uh, you know, this is how you're going to act in year one in November 3rd? I mean, it's weird. Yeah, I think Sean Lewis will probably be fine, I would guess. Uh, I think that it was very in vogue to suggest after their 3-0 start or after the way the season began, that he's probably going to be a head coach after a year. Uh, that may not be the case, but there's a lot of people. Like if Sean Lewis wanted to test the market for an OC, he's going to have a lot of people who are very interested in that conversation. Uh, he does a lot of really interesting things, but they were hamstrung a little bit because of the offensive line. And that makes life really hard for everyone, play callers, receivers obviously Shador Sanders who's been beat up uh and and it wasn't necessarily working but I'm a big believer in continuity I always have been and I think if you're trying to build something we see a lot of these programs that when you're trying to build if you char start churning your staff early it doesn't work I saw this up close with Jeremy Pruitt's staff it doesn't work guys that have been together for a long time and you stick with coordinators I mean we've seen this like Kansas is a great example uh, Lance Leipold, Andy Kotelnicki, uh, you know, uh, Josh Heupel at Tennessee and Joey Halsey have been together like 15 years, right? These things matter. And if you hire people that you don't know as, uh, as coordinators, there's going to be some tension there because there's not a trust level. There's not a, Hey, I see how this works. I, I know where you're coming from. I believe that, that we are aligned philosophically. And when you don't have that, you're going to run into some issues. And I think this was probably a bigger risk for Sean Lewis than it was Deion Sanders. And Deion had to hire somebody um, to be his coordinator. And I thought it made a lot of sense. And for them to pull a sitting head coach um, said a lot about the draw that he had there. But I, I think, you know, I mentioned this in the column, when you're talking about, oh, I'm going to replace these offensive linemen, I think that makes it harder to get your offensive linemen. And when you bring in somebody with the pedigree of Sean Lewis and eight games in, you're demoting him, and you're saying we're going to bring in this. And it also coach. hasn't been a disaster. Yeah, it hasn't been that bad. And you're going to bring in not only just a new that a new bad, but Pat Shermer. If like, I would have told you this sense. is what the offense was going to look like in September, no, not September, August before the season started, wouldn't you've been like, yes, take it right now. Yeah. Like yeah. I don't know, I not it's not that bad. I thought it's been remarkably good, considering yes. their their talent limitations. And I understand that they've got guys like Shador Sanders and and Travis Hunter and. You know, a few others. I mean, Edwards has been much more of an impact than I would have thought somebody his size could be as a true freshman. They've got guys. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I, I think that they've moved the ball very well considering, you know, the offensive line limitations that we all knew existed before the season started. It's bizarre. I, I also um, want to know your t take on this, too, because um, it's out there. And, I, you know, Matthew C. here, one of our most loyal listeners, just said, uh, Dion's looking for scapegoats, even though the buffs have already exceeded their preseason expectations. Like that's the weirdest thing to me. Why do you need a scapegoat? It's going fine. Like, it's not like yeah. it's a disaster. And then two, it also cannot be ignored. And I have to say it. And I don't know if I'm drumming up controversy. I don't think I am, but you know, the head coach's son is playing quarterback too. Like, I don't know what the, it's, like where that fits I mean, into and, and not yeah. only his son is playing quarterback, but getting the crap beat out of him on a weekly basis at quarterback. You know, he's taken more hits than literally anybody in the sport this year. Now we can, you know, dig into, well, is he holding on to it too long? How much is he padding, not holding his Stat line? padding? I don't, I don't know about the stat I'm, padding I'm stuff. I'm joking. I'm joking. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Bruce had a story earlier this year, you know, where a coach had basically said that it was to he was holding on to the ball because he didn't want to sacrifice his completion percentage. You know, he in a video that they posted, Shador kind of scoffed at that, and, and it is what it is. But, like, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And I think, to me, it, it seems concerning, again, 
You don't want to churn assistance. You get this big time coordinator hire where it's going okay, and you punt on it eight games in. And if you look at your program and you say the OC is the issue, that's kind of amazing to me. Like that, mm-hmm. and that your solution is not just it's not just that well, I think the OC is an issue and you'd like to run the ball more, sure. But like, but your solution is I'm gonna bring this NFL head coach who probably has a very tenuous relationship with the offense that we run, and you're gonna put him in charge of it. I just don't I don't see it. Also, I that NFL that coach has an awful reputation of how it went for him in the NFL. Also that it's not like I mean, let's like like call it what it is. I mean, he didn't yes. leave uh the NFL like uh, with with passing marks and his offense. He wasn't even innovation. coaching last year. It is yeah. what it is. So like that's you know, it seems to me that we are overcomplicating a situation that I feel like the upside of this move isn't very high, but the downside of it is tarnishing your reputation as somebody who can go out and make interesting, innovative hires in the future, while also all but guaranteeing that the one star that you hire for your staff is no longer on your staff next year. Well, yeah, and that's part of this too, because you have two options at the end of the year, okay? You can keep this offense and find somebody worse to call it because that's what there's not, you're not going to find a better candidate than Sean Lewis. You're just not. Okay. There's nobody running this offense. You know, maybe Dino Babers gets fired and you hire him. You know, maybe that's something that you could consider or something like that. Or you hit the reset button after year one and you're reinstalling an offense after a relatively successful year based on expectations. I know Dion's expectations were higher. It just doesn't make sense. Like this is, this is again, I, I it's a short term move short-sighted that I don't think it's going to have a lot of long-term positives for a lot of the reasons on the field and off the field and building a staff and, you know, bringing Sean Lewis in was huge, but if you're an OC and you have an offense and you've got a really good job and you're not looking to be a first time play caller and you're in a pretty good spot like Sean Lewis was, and somebody calls you up this off season and says, Hey, you want to come, come down here? You know who my first call is Ari? Quite frankly, it's to Sean Lewis and say, "Hey, what went down there?" And I don't think yeah. I don't think you're going to feel great about walking in if you don't have a relationship with Dion. And maybe Dion's got somebody in his back pocket he knows. But like the idea that Sean Lewis is going to be on the staff next year is not going to happen. And the idea that Pat Shermer is your long term solution for play calling is like patently kind of insane. So it just it just doesn't make sense. I saw some people who cover uh, Texas high school football very closely saying that. You know, even going back down to like the the prime prep days, uh, that he just doesn't do a good job of handling blame. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, yeah. like we talk about personality traits and things of that nature. Like as you sit back and get a window of is this thing going to work or is it not going to work? It's a very um, easy thing to say. Well, he's going to be able to recruit better. He's a star. Uh, he can attract assistance in a way that others probably can't, given his profile and all the stuff. But like. Are we starting to get a sense of actual warts of like tendencies that could hinder him from reaching where he wants to go? And would you go that far to say that this might be one of them? Maybe. I mean, I, I get, Ari, I really do get you want to win now. You want to go, go, go now. And I think that that, you know, decision making and all these things are part of what makes being a college head coach difficult. But at some level, you have to have some sort of patience. And well, also recognize. rational viewpoints of what's possible too, because like you, you know, have to the me, bodies on the offensive line. Yeah, I feel like as the head coach of a program, you walk in day one and you know what you have, and then even after the intense roster flip that they have, you have to go into fall camp with some sort of self realization of who you could be. Like I don't know what Sonny Dykes thought last year uh, before the TCU run. Not the playoff, I can tell you. Um, but that. he didn't. He, 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 but maybe that's the most prime example, for lack of a better word, of a team outdoing what they were probably physically capable of, and a lot of that came down to circumstance as well. Like, I don't know how you could sit here as the head coach who knows what his roster is and came in to fix it, could expect much more than what they've already gotten to the point of desperation. It's one thing if you're like, okay, well, we won a few games. We beat TCU to start. You know, we we started off three and zero, and the Arizona State win that they have is actually looking much better than it than, than it did in hindsight. Uh, you played UCLA close. I know you have kind of a, a a tougher schedule down the road here, but why are you desperate on November third in a 500 season when the team won one game last year and you know the limitations on your offensive line? Like, why I, are you I wonder, desperate? 
I wonder how much of this is just a disagreement on. Okay, Dion says I want to run the ball. Could be a fight. Like it could just be a disagreement. Well, we need to run could... the ball more. We need to run the ball more. We need to run the ball more. Okay. And Sean Lewis says it's not going to work. We don't have the offensive line. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Well, I want to run the ball more. Well, it's not going to work. And then at some point, you get into a sort of an impasse where if you're Dion, maybe you feel like this is your only option. Where just like it's not going to be. We don't. We. But again, I just keep going back to, you know. I wonder even if Bill O'Boyle would be better at calling this offense because he has so much uh, familiarity with it, even though the offensive line has struggled. I just – we see this a lot, Ari. I think, like, Steve Wilkes at Mizzou is a pretty good example of, like, when you come – like, that, that year that he was at Missouri, when they played traditional offenses, Missouri did okay. And when they played college offenses, they got gashed constantly. I think Tennessee was up, like, 35 nothing uh, against them. And, like, these things, like the college game and the pro game are so different. And that's why I kind of like the idea of having Pat Shermer in the house to be able to say, hey, you know, here's some concepts or some things. You mix in a little bit, um, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, add some concepts, some wrong concepts, some past concepts. You mix that in with the college offense. But the fact that you're going to put the NF- an NFL guy in charge of a very college offense, I mean, I'm interested to see how this goes. And I, I – you know, maybe you slow down the pace. Maybe you run it a little bit more. But I just don't, I just don't know that you're going to sit there and 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 have a better offense at the end of the day. And again, I keep coming back to the continuity piece, Ari. If you want to build, you have to have continuity. You have to. They're also playing a really good team on Saturday night. Also, that that's really good on the lines too. <laughs> yeah, and like their strength is your weakness. Yes. So like that legitimately. To me, uh, so so one one thing that I think that we have to get through before we, we hang up here is uh, what is your understanding of how this is going to look in terms <laughs> Great of Great question. Well, considering the program hasn't even confirmed like who's stepping down because you can only have 10 on field coaches. So Sherman's going up. Sean Lewis is still going to be up in theory. Like they haven't, I, you know, they haven't whoever goes down going might down. be wearing Ray bands. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe with that like, little recording light. Yeah. I like that. So I just, I mean, I think it's going to be a mix. I think it's going to be a lot of the same, like, concepts. You can't put in a new offense. But I think you're going to see them slow the pace down a little bit. And I think you're going to see them be more deliberate about running the ball. Will that mean they're better at running the ball? Remains to be seen. I'm very skeptical because they just don't have the bodies to push people off the ball. And as you mentioned, Ari, Oregon State is no slouch. And I will say, somebody in the chat brought it up. Arkansas makes a lot of sense for Sean Lewis. That actually mm-hmm. would be a really good fit. Uh, Arkansas went away from the Baylor offense. Uh, Kendall Browse hired away from TCU. It was working pretty well. The offense was was pretty good. Rocket Sanders was going. KJ Jefferson was pretty well used. Um, we'll see what – I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Arkansas look in the portal for a quarterback. Uh, but going back to that scheme, I could definitely see Sam Pittman getting on board with that. So, I, you know, that's What do we SEC. think of the under of this game here? 61 and a half points is a lot of points for a team that's going to try to force to run the ball. Yeah, well, I might take the team total under on this one. I don't know that I would, you know, because, again, like the idea that Oregon State could just score on like six consecutive possessions, would you Would you say it's impossible, Ari? Mm-mm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I just yeah. – it's a wild decision. And, like, the decision-making tree to me that you identify – the OC is the issue. We're going to make a change at the OC. And my solution is to bring in a guy that doesn't have any experience running this offense. That, it just, it doesn't make sense. Sorry. It doesn't make sense in theory. It doesn't make sense on paper. And I'm just, I'm very skeptical of the results you're going to get here. Yeah. Well, I think when people, you know, express some angst about, handing over a P5 job to somebody who doesn't really have all that much experience. These are the types of things that can kill you. You know, yeah. maybe it won't. I don't know. But, you know, a lot of times people will go, hey, look at that idiot who ran that dumb play on fourth down in a big game. He's stupid. It's like yeah, decisions that are made off the field. A lot of times during the offseason, but sometimes in the season. Yeah. Can really kill you. So I don't know. He's I don't know what happened there. Uh, we'll see what happens moving forward but just i think we both agree it was just bizarre you're bucking a trend here if you can succeed and build without continuity and scheme not a lot of people can do that and i think already too it's worth looking back and saying hey 
Anybody know that TCU's four and five now? Anybody know that Nebraska didn't have its act together that first month of the season? Yep. Colorado State looks pretty good. Like I, I was talking to a friend of ours. If you look back and you look at the full picture of the season and you look at all of Colorado's results, they all make sense now. TCU, yeah. I think if they played that game again, it'd be a coin flip. You know, also too, the it was a coin flip the first time. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And I think Colorado State is a better team than people thought they were. And Nebraska has improved a lot, but they were kind of a mess um, the early part of the season and and gave away a lot of points. And Oregon is a you know a wagon. USC is flawed. Uh, Stanford, I'm not sure what's happening with Stanford, but Stanford is a much improved team. I mean, I look at their schedule here. There was only one game, I guess two, that they were just completely out of. And that was yeah. the Oregon game. And I think they were out of the USC game, the 48-41 score. Yeah. Is a little bit is, if you watched it, it's a little they scored a bunch of points at the end to try to make a comeback, but I never really felt like they were in that game in the second half. Yeah. But you know, if you would have told me, hey, the only game that Colorado would be out of, or the only two games that they wouldn't have a chance to win by November 3rd would be USC and Oregon, I'd be like, okay, that's good, you know, like that's that's good. I mean, so, I will say, all right, the UCLA game felt a little bit like Penn State, Ohio State, in which like, yeah, the score's not that lopsided, but you're watching and you're like, how are you all going to score? Yeah, no, well, you're down five going into the fourth quarter. I think you get. I know. Yeah, game. you're not so, wrong, but it's it wasn't pretty. Yeah, but, there's like two ways of being in the game on the scoreboard and like physically. And I like the distinction between those things. But I think in year one with a roster that got flipped, that being down five points against a ranked team uh, going into the fourth quarter, and I believe it was on the road, I think counts. But yeah, yeah. I mean, either way, I thought that things were going fine. Uh, I didn't think that it was definitely desperation mode. Uh, I didn't think that we would be in a position where Sean Lewis would be the thing we point to as the result of this. And then of course, I didn't think that Pat Shermer would be the savior. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff to unpack here and, you know, Hey, it's always good to get together with you on a Friday afternoon unexpectedly and go 20, 25 minutes on, on a topic <laughs> like this. But, uh, you know, stay tuned for next week when we figure out, uh, um, who is funding the, uh, enterprise of the investigation into the Michigan scandal, and then we'll, we'll 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 do our best here. But you know, hey, it was fun. Dave, enjoy Mizzou. Uh, text me in the middle of the game if you need any column ideas. I'll try to help you out with that. <laughs> I, I think that you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna learn today. I think. But um, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, yep. We have over a hundred people listening live, and you know, as this channel continues to grow, as does the podcast, and you know, I think the company's total investment in our show and it means a lot to us. So. Enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon. Enjoy the games on Friday night. And, of course, enjoy the games on Saturday. Dave and I will be getting back together Saturday night for a live reaction show on what promises to be one of the best college football Saturdays of the year. So, until then, take care. For Dave Ubbin, I'm Ari Wasserman. That was the latest emergency edition of Until Saturday.